YouTube sidekick here with another video about the A-10 DCS and the Cold War. Actually, this video is not so much about the A-10 as it is about the threat that the A-10 was designed to face. In the last video in this series, I, I talked about how the A-10 uh, was designed and why. Uh, and it was really designed for one purpose, and that was to support troops on the ground in Northwest Europe during a Warsaw Pact invasion. But um, we didn't really talk about what exactly that meant. And in fact, I'm not sure I understood just how much that scenario shaped the A-10 design until we actually tried to simulate that situation and fly the A-10 in that simulation. Um, but trying to put together that scenario required thinking a lot about exactly what a Soviet invasion of the Federal Republic of Germany would have looked like <laughs> at ground level, literally. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, if the Warsaw Pact had invaded uh, West Germany, the invasion would have been conducted by a large number of highly mechanized divisions, Soviet divisions basically. It would have been conducted at least initially according to very rigid Soviet doctrine, which was drilled into the officers and men at all levels of the Red Army. The doctrine would have been aimed to generate overwhelming firepower and constant pressure. Frontline units would have basically been used up and then followed up by follow-on forces as quickly as possible in order to build and keep the momentum of the attack. Extra firepower in the form of artillery was held at each level so that it could be concentrated at points of attack for maximum impact. There was a general focus, I would say, on tactical simplicity as well. Everything, all units, were organized according to a common organization, and they all used common tactical drills. Now, this had the benefit of allowing training to be standardized, which was good for the Red Army, but in effect it was also good for NATO, too, because it meant that the threat could be understood and the behavior of the enemy could be predicted. So let's take a look at what uh, NATO understood the uh, Red Army attack would look like. Um, the doctrine of standardization actually started with the organization of Soviet formations and units. There were basically two kinds of formations, uh, both are combined arms. Uh, a tank division was an armored heavy division, and uh, mechanized, uh, the mechanized divisions were known as motor rifle divisions. Now, each division would have been made up of three regiments, which are also combined arms organizations. Uh, below the regiment, the units are organized into battalions, the battalions into companies, and the companies into platoons. Now, platoons consisted of four vehicles, either tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, or APCs. Uh, companies then consisted of three platoons and battalions of three companies, all of the same types of equipment. At the regimental level, the various types were then blended. So like a motor rifle regiment would have had three pure motor rifle battalions and one pure tank battalion. But it also must be said that that tank battalion was usually split into companies that were cross-attached to the motor rifle battalion. So you end up with a motor rifle regiment that would typically operate as three maneuver battalions. Each battalion would consist of three motor rifle companies and one tank company. Uh, each battalion was also typically a combined arms unit because in addition to those maneuver companies, the battalion would include a mortar company, engineers, anti-tank, uh, missiles, and also air defense, and even some organic first echelon logistics. This meant that basically a motor rifle battalion uh, was a collection of about 75 vehicles, of which approximately 50 were front-lined armored vehicles, tanks, APCs, or IFVs. So these battalions, as I said, were then grouped into regiments, and regiments also added more combined arms elements. In addition to the maneuver elements in the battalions, they had a substantial headquarters and support element, including a full battalion of artillery, organic air defense consisting of Shilkas and Strellas, uh, anti-tank missile detachments, engineers, comms, and supply units. A typical regiment would consist of about 350 to 400 vehicles. These regiments were then grouped into divisions. The divisions added their own support that could be pushed forward, including a large divisional artillery group, which included multiple launch rocket systems, and also substantial air defense, including a full battalion of either SA-6 or SA-8 uh, 
great archive at Sam's. So the philosophy of the attack was that each division would push a regiment down each of two possible routes, probably, with the third regiment in reserve, ready to reinforce whichever regiment uh, in the front found a weak spot. Each regiment would initially advance as a column of battalions. The first battalion would form the advance guard and it would also push out a reinforced company to act as what was known as a forward security element. And this was usually a combined arms combat team that included detached mortars and a tank platoon. Um, it was expected that it, this unit, is basically a reinforced company size unit, could deal with any blocking forces of, say, platoon strength without really stopping. Uh, anything that it could not roll over, uh, it would be big enough to at least force that uh, element to either retire or commit and engage. Um, if it was too large for it to overcome, uh, the forward security element would then deploy and fix the enemy so that it couldn't get away. The remainder of the lead battalion would then conduct a hasty assault from the march by deploying into columns of platoons and then eventually into line. And meanwhile, the regimental artillery battalion would probably pull off the route and deploy to provide fire support to this lead battalion that was attacking. The rest of the regiment would just keep on rolling. If the lead battalion was unable to break through whatever uh, resistance it found, it would in turn remain in contact, maybe even digging in in a forward position with the enemy, and it would continue to fix them with direct and indirect fire. At this point, it would be assumed that um, a fairly substantial uh, line of enemy resistance had been encountered. So the regimental headquarters would then likely start uh, make a decision to deploy and start making dispositions for a regimental assault. This would likely include a call uh, to the division for more artillery support. Um, and this uh, assault would then basically consist of deciding, uh, assigning each of the two follow-on battalions to axis of advance based on the tactical situation that had been revealed in the initial attack. It would probably also include pushing regimental assets like air defense and any tank missiles down to those battalions or to the battalion that was already in contact. The objective would always be to get the next echelon into the attack with a minimum of delay and keep pressure on the defenders with direct and particularly indirect fire. So essentially what you have is multiple regiments advancing on separate zones of attack. These start out as single columns and stretch as much as 30 kilometers behind the advance guard. As the resistance is encountered, the whole effort sort of accordions up behind the advanced elements until it's distilled into a mass of as many as 400 vehicles packed into an area um, of about 3 to 5 kilometers wide and about 5 to 10 kilometers deep. It is, as they would say, a target-rich environment for a close air support aircraft. But it's also an incredibly hostile environment for their aircraft because that same concentrated area contains up to 30 man pads, 8 mobile Shorad systems, uh, SA-9s and Chilkas, and it will likely be overwatched by a fully integrated mid- and high-altitude air defense system. And thus, we arrive again at the first rule of being a hog driver. Kill ratio is king. There's just too many targets to take them out one at a time, and you can't afford to sell your life even dearly. And more to the point, those targets are not created equal. Some are serious threats to your continued well-being. Some are serious threats to the forces of freedom and liberty. You can't just show up, drop your ordinance at random, and head back to the O-Club. If you want to drive a hog, you have to be prepared to move some serious mud. But it has to be the right kind of mud. So, I think that's what I'm going to talk about in the next one of these videos. Um, we have learned a lot about how to be effective flying the A-10 in that environment and how to live to tell the tale. A lot of things, frankly, I didn't know before we started this project. So that's what we're going to talk about next time. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. It's going to be Sidekick, signing off.